sisters, but you're in Constantinople and you don't know where to go. Well, at least by the time of the reign of the ever grumpy looking Emperor Justinian, you're going to head to the Messi, literally meaning middle. It was a grand thoroughfare that ran the length of the city going east to west. It's where many of the city's festivals and parades took place, and it passed almost every great monument in the city. And according to the 6th century historian Procopius, it was home to more than 500 prostitutes. But that's not why we're going there, rather, it's the fact that the Messi was the home to many of the daily markets of Constantinople. And it was at these markets that the necessities of life may be easily procurable. They shall sell meat, salt fish, gut, cheese, honey, oil, legumes of all kinds, butter, solid and liquid pitch, cedar oil, hemp, linseed, gypsum, crockery, storage jars. So pretty much any food that you could want was going to be available at one of these markets, like lots of fresh vegetables. And the Byzantines actually ate their vegetables uncooked sometimes, which was not common for cuisines around the Mediterranean in antiquity. You would also find plenty of dried fruits, raisins, prunes, dates. The fresh fruit might be a little bit harder to come by, as much of the fresh fruit was enjoyed by the wealthy, and it was grown in private orchards in and outside of the city. When visiting the city, the Russian Archbishop Anthony of Novgorod was impressed by a series of wells that belonged to the Patriarch near the Hagia Sophia. In the wells, there were baskets that were attached to long ropes, and melons, apples, and pears are kept there. And when the Patriarch is to eat, they pull them out quite chilled. The Emperor eats in this way too. But we're neither the Emperor nor the Patriarch, and I'm guessing that they would have had other people go to the market for them, so we'll have to touch on their diet in a different video. But even if fresh fruit was hard to come by, there were plenty of other delights for the common people, such as olives, honey, different types of cheese. And while expensive, you may even be able to get your hands on a truffle, though the other mushrooms might be kind of hit and miss. For as the Byzantine military strategist Kekov Manos warned, never eat raw mushrooms. They have killed off many large family. Now, just as the fruit was dried, sometimes meat was dried as well. And Constantinople was famous for one dried meat called paston, which is still eaten today in Turkey in many areas, though they call it pasturma. And etymologically, it gave us pastrami. But most of the meat that you would get was fresh, as the animals were slaughtered right there in the city before going to the market. The more common meats were pork, mutton, beef, and different types of poultry, including chickens, geese, blackbirds, and partridges. Goat was also very popular, and it was thought that fat, milk stuffed suckling kids are rich and nourishing above all other foods. Hence my using goat milk today. And if you're looking to get even more out of your comfort zone, then wild donkeys and gazelle could be had at a price. And during Pentecost, or the 50 days following Easter, spring lamb was the meat to get. It was expensive, bit of a luxury item, but it could be had. And even if it is a little pricey, you can be rest assured that you're not getting price gouged because the cost of meat was very well regulated, and there were penalties for breaking the rules. One law decreed that pork, perhaps the most common meat, had to be sold at a certain spot. And anyone who sells pork at an inflated price is to be flogged, shaved, and expelled from the guild of pork butchers. Anyone who takes wine to a nobleman's house and sells them there privately is to be liable to the same punishment. Similar rules were set around the selling of bread, and the ingredients were often weighed before and after baking. But provided you could stand the heat of the ovens, being a baker was a pretty sweet gig, as bakers are never liable to be called for any public service, neither themselves nor their animals, to prevent any interruption of the baking of bread. Now, while bread was available pretty much every day of the year, many of the meats I mentioned were off limits for a good portion of the calendar due to Lent and the many fasting days dictated by the church. So I hope you like seafood. The waters around the Hellespont were some of the most plentiful, and there was a constant stream of fishing boats coming to the docks of Constantinople. One of the most common catches were the small tuna or tunny fish that were very popular in the making of garros, or garum, the ancient fermented fish sauce I often talk about. Though as there were laws about how close the garros factories could be to any population, most of the mackerel and the tunny fish were probably offloaded elsewhere, but some would have made it off in Constantinople. Then it would go to the markets where it would be sold either fresh or pickled or salted. They also had red mullet, monkfish, and skate, along with stingray and the salted roe of the gray mullet. And by the 12th century, caviari, or caviar, was being imported from the Black Sea. Though perhaps the most popular seafood was shellfish, like crabs, oysters, octopus, mussels, scallops, and lobster. In fact, in a description of the market outside of the Hagia Sophia, a traveler calls this out. Outside St. Sophia, there are great squares with stalls where they sell wine and bread and fish, and more shellfish than anything else, since the Greeks are in the habit of eating them. Here they have great tables of stone where they eat, both rulers and common people together. Now that last part kind of seems like a little bit of a crazy assertion. Rulers and commoners eating together? But while it may seem crazy, there are actually stories to back it up. One is about the Ioannis Aiofiorodites, and I'm going to just call him Ioannis from now on, so I don't have to say that last name again. He was a prominent official in the 12th century and a favorite of the emperor at the time. So for context for the story, you need to know that along with fresh foods that you could take home and cook, the markets were famous for their prepared foods, like, like a huge citywide food court. Sausages, bread, skewers of meat, similar to modern souvlaki. Sweets like the fritters that we're making today, and soup. And it was the soup that Ioannis noticed on his way home from the palace one evening. So after leaving the palace, he and his servants are walking through the market, and he notices this woman selling soup, and he goes over and he wants some. But one of his servants is like, you know what, why don't we hold off? We have much better food at our house. Well, Ioannis doesn't want to be told, and so he behaves the same way that I would behave when my mom told us that we couldn't have ice cream because we had popsicles at home. He shot a fierce glance and sharply said that he would do exactly as he pleased. He went straight up to the bowl that the market woman was holding, full of the soup that he fancied, leaned over, drank it down greedily, and had several good mouthfuls of the cabbage. Then he took out a copper penny and handed it to one of his people. Change this for me, he said. Give the lady your two farthings and be quick about giving me back the other two. He was hungry and I'm absolutely on his side. When I need a snack, I need a snack. Though whatever snack I'm eating, it needs to come with something to drink. I can't eat without something to drink. And in Constantinople, that usually meant either water or wine. Now the water, that salty water we talked about, could be had pretty much anywhere. But if you want some wine and you're out and about, then you might have to veer off that main street into a side street to visit a tavern or an inn. Because the markets shall not sell any article which belongs to the trade taverners. Luckily, there were a lot of taverns and inns in Constantinople, but you might want to check the time to make sure they're actually open. Because innkeepers must not open their taverns or sell wine or cook dishes before 8 a.m. on the mornings of the great feasts or Sundays. They must close by 8 p.m. and put out their lights. This practice was in place because it was thought that if people had access to public drinking all around the clock, then that would lead to violence and even riots. Whereas today, I think that if we close down the bars at 8 p.m., that in and of itself would lead to riots. But alas, in Byzantine Constantinople, if it is after 8 p.m. or early in the morning, you're gonna have to head home to enjoy that wine and your honey fritters. So once you've fried all the fritters while they're still warm, put them in a bowl just a few at a time and coat them with the honey. And it helps to warm the honey a little as well. Then sprinkle them with black pepper, and you don't have to toss them, you can just lay them out and drizzle the honey and pepper on them, but they get better coated if you, if you do it the way I'm doing it. And here we are, honey fritters from the Byzantine Empire. Definitely sticky, but they look really good. Hmm. Hmm. They're really, really good. They're actually better than I expected them to be. Partly because my, my favorite thing, I think, is the texture. They are, they kind of remind me of a tater tot.
to go to an amusement park. That's a good thing, you know? And at the amusement park, there's these cinematic expressions. They're new art form. Oh. It's something different from films that are shown normally in theaters. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That's all. Thank you to Movie for sponsoring this video. Martin Scorsese's comment that Marvel films aren't cinema is making waves again with the release of his opinion piece in the New York Times explaining his position. Many cinephiles feel validated, and many people who are fans of Marvel movies and other larger franchises feel offended. Most of the offense, I think, comes from a misinterpretation of his statements as derogatory. But Scorsese gives Marvel films a lot of credit. I say again, are their own new art form. He acknowledges the talent that goes into creating them and that his disinterest in them is largely a matter of personal taste. He doesn't deride or insult anyone who enjoys or makes these movies. What he is saying is that these big budget franchise films are different from the kinds of films that made him fall in love with movies, or what he calls cinema, an art form that he played a role in legitimizing and creating. His concern is not that Marvel movies exist, it's not that people like them, it's that this new type of film is crowding out the type of film that he loves. We don't really have established terms to distinguish between these two types of films, so the way he's chosen to label the difference is by calling the side of film he loves cinema and saying that franchise films aren't cinema, and a lot of people seem to be offended by this. I love long-form TV. I think it's a powerful art form that is often underrated compared to cinema. Scorsese also happens to say that, I thought for a while maybe long-form TV is cinema. It's not. It simply isn't. You know, it's, it's a different viewing experience for the three episodes, two, four, ten. But that doesn't offend me because he isn't saying long-form TV is invaluable, he's just saying it's a different thing. You might disagree with him and think that the cinema label isn't the right way to make that distinction between franchise films and the films Scorsese loves. But there is a difference. One he expresses in the New York Times piece, and one I can show you. Oh, hey. I know you. Me? You're lower than a bastard. It's a book I deeply love, but I'm reading it slowly now. So the words are really far apart and the spaces between the words are almost infinite. Lay cold as a stone. Lay cold as a stone. I don't see a lot of money here. Alpha level confirmed. Encryption code accepted. Safe lines removed. Charlie Carrier's 45 degrees off the port bow. Are you ready? No, Polino. Is your pistol cocked, Mr. Lynn? Yes. Again, the point here is not that one is better than the other, but that there is a distinction between the two. The core of this difference rests in the themes that these two types of films explore and the way they do it. Marvel films do explore emotional themes, but those are often the filler moments between the climactic battles, exciting fights, and character introductions. In what Scorsese calls cinema, these moments are the climactic moments. They are the ride that the movie has to offer. What happened in the end? In the end, they shot it. So it all went to me. In Marvel films, these brief explorations of emotion are decoration for the ride of exciting action showpieces. If you can't see the difference, we'll have to agree to disagree, but I'd encourage you to expand your film palette and maybe explore more of what cinema has to offer outside of franchise movies. The Marvel films do occasionally go to some interesting places, and I'm not denying they hit some emotional beats very effectively, but in my opinion, the entire last decade of the MCU altogether has as much revelation and emotional risk as some individual movies from the last decade. But why does the difference matter, and why make the distinction at all? Well, Martin's point, ultimately, is that as this new thing, as these theme park films gain more and more popularity, they take up space in theaters. There's a finite amount of screens and showtimes in theaters, and the more space is taken up by larger franchise experiences, the less room there is for the cinema that Scorsese loves dearly. Great artistic films aren't going to stop existing. A lot of quality cinema is still being made, but those films are increasingly getting pushed onto online platforms, and the opportunities to see those kinds of movies in a communal atmosphere at a theater is diminishing. Many will have to see Scorsese's latest film, The Irishman, at home on Netflix instead of in theaters because of the more limited showings. Each year, it becomes increasingly difficult for me to see the films I'm interested in seeing at my local theater, and every year, those same theaters are filled with more and more reboots, remakes, and franchise films that I'm personally not very excited about. One of the greatest living directors is speaking up for a portion of his art form that he loves, that he sees as disappearing. He's giving a gentle and nuanced criticism of an industry that is creating huge corporate box office hits, raking in billions of dollars, and dominating the theatrical market. The Marvel movies that people love are not going to disappear or diminish in value if Martin Scorsese says they're not cinema, and the Disney Corporation does not need you to defend them or their product from a few rogue directors expressing.